things. It's our goal to provide you with resource information and tricks of the trade that you definitely need in order to pursue a career in entertainment. And we also hope to inspire, encourage, and motivate you by interviewing people that are currently making their dream a reality in show business. And we hopefully, you're going to call in today, we, we encourage you to call in and ask questions of our guests and at any time during the show, and I have the computer right here, so when you call in, I will take your call directly. You don't have to go through someone screening the call. So get a pen and paper, uh, 818 602 Four four nine eight eight one eight six zero two four four nine eight, and I will see your little phone pop up here and we'll take your call and by the way if you like the show you found that it helped you in some way we'd love to hear about it on the forum and that's on uh, a link on the BBS talk radio page and you can post and read comments and also check out some of the other great shows that are offered on BBS like Curvy Fashionista hosted by Jacqueline Britton and Out There which is hosted by Jeff Rector he's on right before me and you can also email us at Priscilla at questionreality.us. Now we have a very intriguing guest today and you all have been emailing me. When is she coming on? When is she coming on? Well, she is on today and her name is Mary Lou Belli and she is among so she has so many titles i got four pages printed out it's just too many titles but most of all she's a wonderful person and a and a natural teacher which is what um what we are going to hear today she's going to teach us some things uh that we need to know to pursue a career in entertainment and things we need to do and not do when we go on auditions. But first, we are going to talk about our spotlights, and our first spotlight company is gonna to go to Hollywood OS. And as you know, I love Hollywood OS. It's where I got started when I did background work. They're a wonderful casting company for background. Uh, lovely people, Angela owns it, and David is one of the account reps over there. And they are always casting for great movies. Right now, they're currently casting for Grey's Anatomy, I think they may not be. I think we're in hiatus, aren't we, Mary Lou? I think we are. They, <laughs> she would know. They were casting for Grey's Anatomy and the Katherine Heigl movie, but they are always casting for great projects. So if you go to their website, HollywoodOS.com, uh, they have all of the current features and shows that they're casting for, and you get a week free just to kind of try them out. And also, if you tell them that you heard this ad on Question Reality, you will will get their wonderful book which I love 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 this book and I've told you why so many times I keep telling you but it's true it's called extra work for brain surgeons the guide to working in show business and it's a $30 value and you will get it for free and I cannot tell you how great this book is especially at the end where they have all of the productions where people have written to them and said they were ripped off they didn't get paid for things they have all of the companies that do scams they have everything that you could possibly uh, imagine. Oh, we have a caller. Oh, so soon? I haven't even got Mary Lou on yet, and there's a caller. My God. Well, definitely check out Hollywood OS, and, you know, we're going to go ahead and take the call. Um, uh, you're on the air. Hi. I'd like to ask a question. I'm trying to listen to uh, Priscilla Leona, but I'm not getting anything but a song playing over and over. Is there a way to... Uh... I'm I'm on the air right now. Yes. And oh, I'm sorry. You, you oh, well, I wanted to, to ask a question of uh, Mary Lou, and um, I just tried to get on. And, and is it okay to ask her a question now, or should I wait? No, you can. She can hear you, and I can hear you. And if that's a technical question, unfortunately, Sam is the man to do that. I am so sorry. I do not okay, know why okay. you keep hearing that. But go ahead and ask okay. the question. Uh, I was wondering, as far as an actor just starting out, if um, if you should, if you think you want to kind of go into mostly comedy acting, but uh, you know, should you should you focus on that, or would it be a good idea to study all kinds of acting? You know, just as far as spending your time on one thing or, or getting a well-rounded education. I was wondering about that. I think if your focus is going to be comedy, um, it's nice to be an expert in something. Now, that's not to say that you can't, um, uh, once you are established, do almost anything you want. But in terms of if you think comedy is your forte and if you think that this is where you would like to see yourself on the big screen or small screen, 
I would uh -huh. say, you know, there's there's lots of avenues for, for studying and for getting involved with other people who are good at comedy. There's improv groups, there's the Groundlings, there's Acme, there's Olympic Improv, where you can meet like-minded people. And then, you know, very often a, a casting breakdown will come out and having those sort of um, credits, you know, that you are in a comedy club, that you're in an improv group, speaks um, volumes to a casting director who wants to seriously consider you for a part that you have experience in comedy. Um, okay. I also highly recommend the Harvey Lembeck Comedy Workshop. It's a great place to study. And um, there's okay. a man named Scott Sedita who wrote a book called The Eight Characters of Comedy. And Scott Sedita um, also has his own acting studio in um, Los Angeles, which I highly recommend studying at. Okay, so so you you do think it's best? I mean, you do think it's good to study other kinds as well, but just focus on the comedy. Is that I sound? would I would, and and another avenue if comedy is your your strength and where you see yourself um, getting work, I would say you, you know if you think you're a person who could do stand up, go for it. It's a mm -hmm. great it's a great place to showcase yourself. Okay, great. Well, thank helps. you so much, Mary Lou. Appreciate your help. Oh, very happy. To. Thank you very much, caller. Okay, bye bye. Bye bye. And that was uh, our very first caller for Mary Lou. I didn't even get to introduce her, but I guess all those emails I sent out really, really help because most people uh, know now uh, who Mary Lou is. But she basically is an award, an Emmy award winning producer, writer, and director. And she just finished directing her seventh consecutive season of Girlfriends, which is a show I love, um, on the CW network, as well as her webisode series called Three Way. And you definitely have to check that out. And I wish I had the, the website address. Is it just three it's way? www.threewaytv.tv threewaytv.tv and I watched uh, the the last season of that and I was hysterical I just loved that little lady when she had the her uh, obsessed girlfriend following her around that was the last uh, the last the season finale it right was the season finale. so I'm so excited I can't wait till it is coming back oh, am I right we sure hope so for a second season that is my, now let's talk about uh, girlfriends you mm -hmm. were there working on that for seven years seven years now were you I, I noticed that and I know a lot of people have asked me that they say that um, they see a lot of different directors names on the episodes they see repetitious names but they see a lot of different people's names how is it that a director is chosen to direct a particular episode well you know um, in terms of situation comedies two things happen you're either the seasoned director or or you're one of many directors. Um, the derogatory term is the director du jour. Oh. Um, but I'd like to think that, you know, if you come back consistently for seven seasons, that you're considered one of the in-house directors. You're done. Um, but basically, it's a, it's a choice by the producers as to would it be better to have only one director during the whole season because the cast likes it. Girlfriends has um, sometimes focused more on one predominant director certain seasons than others um and i've also been the season director of some other shows where i was the only one directing all the episodes but on um the writer producers uh or the showrunner as we call them um y it's usually that person's decision how to um choose the directing staff sometimes it can be one sometimes it can be a different episode uh, director for every episode and that sometimes numbers up to 22 episodes in one season um, so uh, I, I've been the director du jour <laughs> so they don't and I've the been the house so they don't at the beginning say okay for this particular episode we're gonna have this director that director and then we're gonna rotate them well do sometimes they, it's a rotation they, very often I'll do three or four in a row okay um, you know come in for a group um, of episodes uh, it depends it's varied so, so on it's, I've directed many many shows and it's it's been different on all of them yeah we we just couldn't figure out how it is it just they're sitting at lunch one day and a producer and a director comes up and says well I've directed this and that and that I'd love to direct uh, an episode of your show and they say okay well what about next week that doesn't no, happen it usually it's there's, there's, a, there's a season when it usually happens and it's actually beginning right now or at least it used to happen right now 
if upfronts or when the new season for the n following year is announced in May, um, then usually June is what they call the staffing time. Mm -hmm. And they first staff the writers, then they staff the directors, and then basically it's about agents calling back and forth with business affairs for that network and deciding which date you're going to get. I mean, I've had, like last year on Girlfriends, I had all my dates assigned. I think I was going to do three in September and a couple more in Jan, and you know, four more in January and February. And then they call back and said, oops, one of the directors is pregnant. Will you switch um, some dates? And you know, it, it's a family. Right. So, you know, absolutely fine. So, you know, we switched some dates so that she could um, direct uh, earlier in her in her pregnancy and it was it worked it was out okay. just fine so why don't you take us through a lot of people are so curious who don't have the option of knowing uh, a casting director um, take us through the process of what a cast director does or what a direct let's do director because are you also are your your casting director as well so as a director um, Take us through from the very beginning, the table read, for lack of Fine. a better okay. word, so to Okay, so on a multi-camera sitcom, which is different from a single-camera sitcom, a multi-camera sitcom is very much like, uh, it, it's a five-day process. Um, it rehearses like a play for the first three days, and then cameras come in for the last two days. Um, the first day um, is called the table read day, and basically you do literally that. You read around a table, and everyone... Um, who is anybody basically listens to it from the network um, executives to the studio executives to all your designers and crew um, that need to hear it early on. You usually rehearse that day as well and it gives uh, that first day after the writers have heard that first table read they go and rewrite. On the second day you um, basically are rehearsing again all day a n newly written or revised script, something that we say in the business has been punched up. Um, and we basically, uh, at the end of that rehearsal day, we do a run through only for those writers. Then on the third day, you come in and rehearse yet another revised punched up script. And that, um, and at the end of that day, you do a run through, um, kind of like a, like a mini dress rehearsal, but without the dress. Um, without the costumes for um, the network executives and the studio executives. And then on the fourth day, you come in to your hopefully what we call the final draft, and you start um, scheduling, per se, what the cameras will be. So you do a camera blocking rehearsal for every single scene, not necessarily in order of the show, and you practice it that way, and then um, you go home after you've done all those scenes, um, it tends to be a fairly long day. Also, on a show where you might need to have a special effects or a very complicated scene that's not going to shoot in front of the audience the next day, you might want to pre-shoot that scene. So Thursday or the fourth day usually is um, a camera blocking and or pre-shoot day. And then finally, um, on Friday you come in, You it's usually a later day. You don't usually start early in the morning. You usually start midday you review what you did on Thursday with the cameras and then an audience comes in and early in the evening to hopefully not too late in the evening <laughs> you um, tape or film that show in front of a live studio audience whose uh, laughter is actually being recorded live as you do it. Now is that with every sitcom or is that with uh, some sitcoms that you have the live audience? With a almost every multi-camera sitcom, the whole idea of doing it multi-camera, and this was actually Desi Arnaz's idea for his wife Lucy, um, you do it live in front of an audience with the, that, that laughter being recorded live. Now, some people may not know the difference between a multi-camera multi show and a single camera. Can you explain sure, the that's difference? Sure, it's very easy. A single camera show shoots like a movie. It basically, you uh, out of order, you shoot, you um, rehearse one scene, and then you film it with one camera. Sometimes there's an extra camera. Um, but basically you're shooting um, uh, all what we call coverage, your different shots, your master shot, your three shot, your two shot, your over the shoulder shot, your close ups, your extreme close ups if you're doing a, um, a, a soap opera kind of look. Um, but basically uh, you're, sh you're shooting those one at a time. 
the whole idea behind a multi-camera show, and, and you go scene by scene by scene. So you might get a fifth of the show done on one day, a fifth of the show done the next day. And, it, you know, usually you, you shoot it over five days, and it's a full day. And an example of that, in case you want to visualize that, would be a show like The Office. Am I correct? The Office, um, Malcolm in the Middle. Um, there's lots of shows that, that have that's that. That's single camera. Yeah. Um, My Name is Earl is a current one that's on the air. Now, the, um, and Everybody Hates Chris mm -hmm. is a single camera show. Then you have um, a multi-camera show, which is the, the week I described. And basically, you shoot all of that show um, except for possibly those few pre-shoot scenes, live in front of an audience. So instead of taking five days to shoot, because you have four cameras shooting simultaneously, you're getting that same coverage mm -hmm. of your master, your two shot, your three shot, your over the shoulders and your close ups by four cameras that record or film or tape simultaneously. So mm -hmm. it's basically, you do it in four or five hours, hopefully. And it's very efficient and you do and because you've rehearsed it for three or four days it ho hopefully it's like recording a really well rehearsed play mm -hmm. so th you're not hopefully doing multiple takes for performance hopefully the performance is perfect every time you see it and sometimes we do as little as two takes for wow. every scene and we move on to the next one. Oh, i love that well, mm -hmm. it is, and, and it also keeps it very fresh for the audience because you want their laughter to be um, spontaneous. And trust me, if you've seen a joke, and this was Desi's actual um, motivation for designing this for Lucy, if you've seen a joke ten times, it's not as funny. Mm -hmm. The first time, it's funny. The second time, you know, you'll laugh again. Yeah. But the sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, yeah. tenth, you know, it, it gets a little a little old a little stale do they have a, a, a person out in the audience are they prompters you know they're like laugh laugh no. they, they don't do that anymore no, where they that hold doesn't. the card i'll tell you what we do have out in the audience we have what we call a warm-up person and sometimes that's a person who's a dj and keeps some music going but very often it's a um up-and-coming stand-up comedian mm -hmm. um on the first show i worked on our um <laughs> our warm-up guy was a a guy who's now famous named Bob Saget. Wow! Bob Saget was the first warm-up guy in the first show I ever worked on in Hollywood. Oh, cool! Um, but um, basically, what a warm-up person does, it keeps the audience um, uh, entertained between takes and while you're moving cameras from one set to another or um, during the time that the writer and producers are conferring with the director and then the director is giving notes to actors in between mm -hmm. takes. Um, but also... Prior to starting every scene, the warm-up person will remind the audience what just happened. Because if you're seeing a recording of a show that usually will play in 22 minutes, mm -hmm. and you're breaking it up into little five-minute scenes or three-minute scenes or sometimes 30-second scenes, you sometimes go, well, now what just happened? Right. Um, what's happening? And, 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 or sometimes you, if you haven't been a person who has been watching the show, sometimes you need to know some backstory right. that will make you, uh, clue you into what's happening, mm -hmm. which will often give you a, a better idea of the story, the characters, their motivation, their interaction with each other. Correct. Good. Well, um, a lot of, now, while this is going on with the rehearsal, the actors, I've been asked this question, and someone sent me an email to make sure I asked this, and I thought, oh, God, I hope Mary Lou doesn't mind this. Someone said... Do, do they provide all, you see all these beautiful clothing that the actors have, like on Girlfriends. My mm -hmm. God, you know, I was watching that and I thought, wow, you know, she, her outfit. Do they provide uh, the clothing or do you wear, are the actors required oh, to have? There is, there is a, should people prepare in advance like a whole lot of money to buy clothing if they get cast? You won't need any cast? clothing at all. Okay. Basically, if you get cast, um, occasionally, 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 they'll ask a man to bring in a suit that they particularly like. And if they ask you to wear your own clothes, they will pay you a fee for wearing your own clothes. But 99% of the time, um, a wardrobe um, uh, uh, is provided a, a, a for wardrobe you. Is provided for you and designed for you or picked by a designer or the person who is head of your costume department on that particular show. Okay. Um, and some shows have philosophies that... Um, 
you never wear a costume more than once. Oh, you know, do you get to keep them? <laughs> uh, no, you no. don't get to keep them. But I, I've been on shows that have been canceled, and sometimes they sell the show, oh. the, the um, clothes at the end. And you oh, know, if fun. I knew that I had the same size shoe as one of the actors on the show, uh -huh. you, you, you'd believe that I'd rushed oh, there and tried to buy the at a discount. Some of them actually sell them. Um, to uh, at the end of the season, if they know they're not going to use them again, to some um, thrift stores oh. that specialize in um, uh, uh, memorabilia, show, celebrity me memorabilia. Well, not even memorabilia, just show just clothes. Show clothes. In fact, wow. um, I have a son, and I was just working on a costume for his middle school play today, uh -huh. and inside the pocket was a very, very expensive Italian suit for. A 14-year-old boy and inside I found a little tab in the pocket which was I knew it must have been a costume because it was a tab that um, customers use um, regularly let's say to um, tape a tie down to a shirt so it doesn't move during mm -hmm. a take oh. and I thought ah this is a war this is a wardrobe this ah. was from a thrift store that specialized in in um, show wardrobe. And I see you'd know that most people would go, oh, that's a damn piece of tape. Let me throw that away. Mm, no, I knew and what it was. you would know that. Yeah. See? Well, it was it's the backing to the adhesive. I knew what it was. Ah, you knew that. Now, I watched, I want to talk about um, Three Way because that was so hysterical. Um, you directed that. Mm -hmm. I directed the pilot in about six or seven episodes. This is a fantastic. I highly recommend that you watch this program. And again, if you go to threeway.tv. TV. TV. <laughs> You can watch this live, and uh, it is so funny. I had tears rolling out of my eyes. I have my favorites. I'm not going to tell Mary Lou who they are, but uh, some of them just were hysterical. We have another caller. Okay, let's take that call. Hi, you're on the air with Mary Lou. Hello, Priscilla. This is Alan. How are you? Oh, I'm fine, Alan. How are you? Wonderful, wonderful. Just uh, calling. Uh, I have a few questions. Okay. Uh, first, I want to say that uh, to you, your show is amazing. I love it. I love the energy, your guest, the subject matter. It's perfect. Thank you Wonderful. very much. Great. I appreciate that. But uh, uh, I've recently had an opportunity, and I, I spoke with a producer and writer uh, regarding a uh, role. And being the first uh, project that I'd ever be involved with, and I'm non-union with the, uh, and do not have an agent. Uh, when is an appropriate time to ask questions regarding to uh, how much pay? Uh, when the pay? When when do I need? If I am cast in this uh, movie, uh, when is the pay received? And uh, how long will I be required on set? Because you know, as they say, don't quit your day job. <laughs> right. So want, Especially if you have a I good want, one. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. So I don't want to quit my day job, uh, but I want to try to find a schedule as to work around uh, being, and, and how long am I going to be on set, and if I can take a, a leave of absence from my job. But uh, regarding, like, pay-wise, uh, when is, is there an appropriate time to ask a certain question regarding pay? Well, let's ask Mary Lou that. What's the answer? You know, I, I unfortunately have never worked on a non-union show, but I would say the moment someone says they want you, that's your that's your door open to say when and for how much. And I think getting that discussed immediately is probably in your best interest. And I don't think it's unusual for you to be able to to expect answers to those questions so that, A, if it is a non-union show, um, that you could take a leave of absence. Um, I would say for the efficiency of the show, um, and I always think this is a good rule for anyone um, who is starting out, put yourself in your boss's shoes. So if he needs to efficiently, as the producer of the movie, um, work an 8 to 10 hour day, which is probably what you're going to do on a non-union film to make it efficient and to get as much um, coverage and footage as possible um, efficiently in a day, then I would say you should expect that the days you are shooting will be full days, um, especially if you're heavy in the movie. Um, and I think, um, I don't know what, you're, what you can expect as a wage, 
Um, but if this is your first time in the movie and this is the first time you're getting um, uh, some footage of your own that you will then use as a showcase um, tool to get your next job, um, I would say probably take what they give you because basically you're, you're uh, and make sure that you get it in writing that you get a copy of it. You want a copy of it and you want to know the date you're working and you want to know how much you're going to be paid. But realize that this is an investment in yourself and your future career. So the most important thing that you get out of this is a copy of it so you can show it to somebody else. Right. It's, yeah, and it's a significant role. More, a lot. Uh, Did I, I mean, say congratulations? I, oh, yeah, congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Yes, he, he's, he's pretty much told me just speaking with him that uh, he would love me in this role. But uh, uh, I just uh, I just don't, you know, I have uh, other responsibilities that I take care of. So I just want to make sure at the when when do I expect a first check? Is it years afterwards? Um, after the I would expect I would expect uh, uh, first of all I would ask when you were going to get paid and I would expect that the answer would be somewhere between 30 to 60 days after filming has ended. I mean to be perfectly honest the unions don't ask for uh, more than that in terms of um, when uh, they expect payment. So that's what I would expect 30 to 60 days. And and make sure you have the address of the production company so that yes. if they don't pay you, you know where to find, find them. them. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Very important yeah. because, you know, starting out in non-union, to be quite honest with you, a lot of people, and that's why I was recommending that you get that book from Hollywood OS because a lot of people do, unfortunately, get ripped off. They do the production and then they don't get paid or they sometimes don't even get a copy. A lot of times when you answer ads, say, in um, a certain magazine and they say copy credit meals where you're not even getting paid, you don't even get the copy. So you definitely need to always get the address, phone number, and call and make sure that it's legitimate. Okay. So, May I also recommend yeah. two other books? Um, Scott Sedita, who wrote Eight Characters of Comedy, has a brand new book that just came out within the last week. I think it's probably on the uh, Los Angeles Times bestseller list by now. Um, and I think it's Scott Sedita's Guide to Make it in, Making It in Hollywood. I know his name is in the title. And spell and that last Sedita name. Sedita is spelled S-E-D-I-T-A. And the other book that I would highly recommend is um, by Judy Kerr. And it's called Acting is Everything. And it's um, less a craft book than it is a every, all the information you need at your fingertips. It's a fabulous, fabulous resource book. Right. Um, so I highly ran it back. And Judy Kerr's last name is spelled K-E-R-R. And did I mention I wrote two books? Oh, yes. We have her two books for sure. One of them is called, and you definitely, while you're in the bookstore getting all the book, get all your books at once. And I tell you why, because you really should know the business aspect of acting. You, if you choose to be an actor, you are choosing to be an entrepreneur, you are choosing to be a business, and you really need to know the business aspect. So read before you go out and jump into non-unions or any other project because you really do need to know uh, what you're doing. You have to have some sense of that or else you're going to get ripped off or you're not going to advance as, as fast as you, you'd like. One of the books um, that Mary Lou uh, Belli is uh, involved with, she was a co-writer for Acting for Young Actors. And uh, you definitely want to get that book uh, if you have a child and you're thinking about getting your child involved in the business and the other one is and this one oh my gosh I'm so glad she gave me a copy because I've been wanting this forever it's called the sitcom career book and it's written by um, Mary Lou Belli and Phil Ramuno 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 R-A-M-U-N-O and I believe you could get these if you went to amazon.com amazon.com and also um you know there's a specialty shop in Los Angeles uh, called Samuel French, <clears throat> excuse me, Samuel French Bookstores, and another one in Los in New York called the Drama Bookshop, and yeah. they specialize in showbiz books. So um, if you want to spend hours just looking at a shelf and saying what book is going to just really help me, especially you know there's probably help especially for a non-union actor doing his first yes. film. Right. So hey, listen, good luck with Thank that. You, you know, so have much. a great shoot and and and. 
and enjoy the money you make doing it. Right, and call us again, oh. okay, caller? Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank end of the call I, I i i never know when i'm clicking if i'm going to crash the whole system but yeah you definitely want to get these books especially if you know i was watching a show i don't know if you watched it mary lou but it was uh danny bonaducci's um i know my kid is a star and it, i a lot of people are like, why are you watching that i find every reality show fascinating i'm a reality show fanatic and a sitcom fanatic and i found that so many people could have learned so much from that show because not enough mothers or fathers or parents who want their child to get started really know what's involved in the business side of it. That's why if you want your child to uh, get started, you want to get a book first. And Acting for Young Actors is a great book, I would imagine. I haven't read it, but if Mary Lou was involved, it's a great book. But you want a, a book because a lot of times you don't want to get labeled a stage mom and uh, we're going to talk about that in future episodes. But Can, can I just yes. say that my co-author on um, Acting for Young Actors is a wonderful, wonderful acting coach, acting teacher, and um, author all um, on her own named Dinah Lenny. Um, and also, you know, just because you brought it up, the genesis for this, the, um, a, uh, the sitcom career book, which was really my first book, um, came from the fact that we, um, my co-author and I, who are both sitcom directors, um, probably 200 to 300 episodes between us that we have directed would have actors come to the set who have booked the job. It's a big deal and they weren't prepared and it's not because they weren't serious actors. It's not because they weren't trying their best. They just didn't know what was expected and um, we really wrote this book for them. This book is for people who have Oscars, for people who have, are Broadway stars, for anyone who has never set foot on a sitcom set. It's basically the inside information you should know in order to do your best work um, in this business when you come in because it's a very specialized field and it moves really fast and a lot of ex is expected of you in those five days. Correct. There, as a matter of fact, a f and correct me if I'm wrong, Mary Lou, but sitcoms are very different than film and very different than theater and very different than commercials and very d different than industrials. And you really need to know, you know, how the people work from the producer and director to how things run smoothly from beginning to end. Is that correct? It's and true. And, you know, we have a whole vocabulary that is that is. Um, particular only to sitcoms. Exactly. So when a director or producer will give you a note and if you have that kind of blank stare like I have no idea what you're asking me to do because I don't understand the lingo of this particular field it, it really will hurt you rather than help you. So um, actually um, in every chapter there are vocabulary words that are mentioned and explained in the text and that the uh, sort of as a review for every chapter we put these um, words in a sentence um, in the sitcom career mm -hmm. book um, so that you can say if a producer said this to you or a director said this to you would you know what they mean and would you be able to um, do the next take with the change he or she wanted of you because you understood what the director was asking Oh, absolutely. I'm looking in the book now and I see exactly what you're saying. It, it starts from being asked a question and I guess how you would answer that appropriately and what that particular particular word means. For example, on film, a lot of times they use, you know, oh, that's that, for example, uh, that's the martini shot or that's the Abby Singer shot, you know, and people would not, if you don't know that, you know, you, you're, you don't, you, you're just kind of going to get frustrated. You're yeah. going to be very frustrated not knowing what these things are. You know, the Abby Singer shot, I knew what the Abby Singer shot was before I actually worked ah. for Abby Singer. <laughs> you worked for Abby, Abby Singer was, um, was my, um, UPM line producer on a, the, the second show I directed called Major Dad. Oh my God. So it's true. She always called the shot and it wasn't the last one, right? Right. Oh, well, it, it, she called the last shot it's of actually, the day, right? Wasn't it? And, and, and Abby's never... actually a man. Abby's a man. Abby's I a did man. not know An that. An elegant, lovely, wonderful, efficient, um, 
Uh, is he still with us? Oh, he's still with uh, us. Um, although I don't know that he's actually actively working as a UPM anymore, but oh he's left God. a legacy and a name of a shot. Behind yeah, him. I mean, you can't get better than that, leaving a name in a, a, a film, a film term name. Yeah. Now you are. Can you're also a casting director? No, I'm actually not you're a casting not a director. Casting director. My God, see, never I went have to, been. I went to a casting director workshop, and I had assumed that she was a casting director. I I am so sorry. I thought you saw all these little actors coming and I had lots of questions from you them. know and I love casting directors and there's lots of great ones out there and and I admire you know I, I think I it's not a job I'd be really really great at because you're too casting nice. no no I think <laughs> casting directors who are really good at their job kind of have rolodexes in their heads yeah and you might say I want a person like this and this and a great casting director can just not only know the talent level of the person there whose name they're about to mention to you but you know, then spit out yeah. 20 names at you about this person would be perfect. That's true. We have another caller. My goodness, I'm not going to get to th- get through Mary Lou's uh, credentials here. She's so popular. You're on the air. Hello? Hello? Yeah, hi. This is uh, Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. You're on the air with Mary Lou Belli. Do you have a question? Yes. I was wondering, you know, you're, I, you're, I was wondering about the casting director workshops and uh, when she thought that, what stage in your career that you thought that that would be very effective to do those? I think to workshops. Are this is Jonathan effective. Shaw, by the way. Hi, Priscilla. Jonathan Shaw. Jonathan, I think that casting director workshops are effective anytime. I can barely I, hear you. I think that anytime you have an opportunity to meet someone who can give you a job, you are increasing your luck factor if you can show them how good and talented you are. So I highly believe in attending casting director workshops and getting your face and your work in front of them. Are you calling us from planet Earth, Jonathan? Because we can barely hear you and there's all kinds of activity going on. Are you calling from a cell phone? Hello? I guess we lost Jonathan. Okay, Jonathan, well, if you could go to a landline, that would be fantastic. Okay, so Mary Lou it has directed, she has over 100 uh, episodes to her credit. She directed Living with Fran. Oh, my God, who loves Fran Drescher? I do. do. We, <laughs> I love this woman. I used to watch her on The Nanny, and she always had the best clothes, and she has the best body, and I'm like, why can't I be Fran Drescher? And she was, her comedic timing was just perfect. She's brilliantly talented. Talented and oh. has and works so hard on the set and has a a knowledge of almost every aspect of the business in terms of sitcoms like I've never seen before. It was a pleasure doing Living with Fran. I it, she's so talented and so funny and and you know when someone is so good at what they do, they kind of raise everybody's game. So you basically do your best work because it's expected of you because they're doing their best work. So it sort of just brings the level so far up. You know, I felt like that on Girlfriends too with Mara Brock-Akeel who created the show. Um, Just, you know, saying, are we doing our best? And can we do more? As a director on sitcoms, what do you, who is the ideal actor? What do they do for you? What do they do? Well, you know, the ideal actor for me comes in on time Mm -hmm. and comes in prepared. Because once someone comes in, first of all, that they show up and they're prepared, then we get to do all the other fun things. If they've already done their homework, then basically we get to then layer on top of that. If a person doesn't come in knowing um, their fundamentals, like their lines, or even more um, appropriately, what they want to do with that character, then basically we're, we're, we're starting from scratch. So anyone who comes in, and then the other um, aspect of an actor that I really, really like on a set is a person who is what I call low maintenance, who doesn't need to know that constantly how good they are I'm assuming you should assume if I have cast you if you are on that show if you are being paid professionally to be there you are exactly who we want and we think you're fabulous and um, always assume that you're unbelievably good unless I tell you so (laughs) and I will tell you so if I want something different or I want to play with you or try something I will do that Um, and um, I have what I call my little, can I say? Yes. Yeah. Um, I have my little bullshit scale, I call it, <laughs> that your talent level 
must never must always exceed your bullshit level so because i'll put up with a lot with from anybody as long as you're more talented they than you are a pain in the neck (laughs) i love that and i imagine you run across a lot of that in the business my god and so basically uh, if they do all of that that is a star in your book and you'd love to work with them and most likely you'd remember that actor oh um i remember an, an actor who comes in does their job and goes home is my favorite kind of actor and there it's a short list but there's a list of i never want to work with that person again and, and what, trust me everyone has that little list and they share it that's so right. there's um you town. know what's on that list for you what do they do that really is not going to get them on your good good side um showing up late showing obviously. up late um not being, being prepared. W- not being prepared being rude to other actors um um and you know I love actors. I really love actors. So I always go, why are they behaving badly? And very often it's fear or some other thing that is stopping them from doing their best or or making them put up roadblocks to doing their best work. So I always ask myself, why are they behaving this way? But if if I talk to you and you're still you still continue to behave that way, you know? I call it my life is too short mm-hmm. list. Life is too short to have to put up with you. <laughs> right. Because there's too many really, really talented people who haven't gotten the chance. You know, right. for any given role, especially with a good casting director bringing in actors, I sometimes see six, seven, eight people, all of whom I would be happy to have in that part. And I only get to choose one or we only get to choose one. Right. And if you come on the set and you don't realize that you can be replaced right you can be replaced by you know six other people i saw for this role who were fabulous and i wished i could have cast them all but Mm -hmm. i couldn't Mm -hmm. and you got the part and you don't deserve it now by the way you're behaving right you should always maintain a sense of being humble because you are you're being monitored and judged at every single in every single thing you do even when you don't think you're being watched you are and and it's their job and you should always conduct yourself uh in a, an appropriate manner and always be humble and uh, no name dropping boy that's a pet peeve of mine i don't know i run into a lot of actors and they they're on the set and and one thing and i i don't know if you run across that but uh one thing not to do on set is to talk badly about a director you worked with or how bad he or she was or a producer because it is not something that is going to stay between you and the other person and I hear that so much and I'm thinking why are they doing that are they insane mm-hmm. and would you say that that's part of behaving badly not to do that don't do that do not participate you know if you don't it. like someone keep it to yourself keep it to yourself don't participate in rumors and so you and I you have also directed um, Misconceptions, starring Jane Leaves. Oh, my God. Who is better than her? I could listen to her accent. She was on Frasier. She played Daphne on Frasier. Yeah, she was wonderful. And, um, I did not see Misconceptions, unfortunately. All the other ones are huge. It was It was fun, but short-lived. Okay, but I would have loved it because I love her. Eve, I haven't watched that one, actually. No, that's with hip-hop artist starring Eve. And I imagine she's fun to work with, uh, huh? You know, it's so funny. I'll tell a little anecdote. Before I got the job... um. Um, the script supervisor who had done the pilot uh, had called me and I said actually um, and she said you're going to love her you're going to love her I said I don't know if I'll love her I'm going to be petrified of her (laughs) I got her CD this is a really really tough city Philadelphia Uh girl and my friend Ellen Deutsch who actually is um, speaks a lot in the sitcom career book I quote her a lot said you'll love her she'll love you she's down to earth she's real and I loved True. working for the three season I directed Eve um, it was a great show it was created by a talented woman named Meg Deloche and Meg just um, created a, a perfect vehicle for Eve's talent and you know when someone who is an expert in one field being a Grammy Award winning um, singer rap artist to come into a field where she isn't known now she had done I think one of the barbershop movies before we had started Eve maybe both I can't remember the the sequence of that exactly um, but a sitcom is, is very different you don't rehearse it like a movie you rehearse it like a play and you basically in front of the audience do you know a 22 minute play where you do the scenes a couple times mm-hmm. 
And there was a point during near the end of the first season where all of a sudden you saw Eve go from a person who was excellent at it and didn't, you know, and, and didn't ever give herself enough credit for how good she was at it to a person who went, ah. Oh, I love this. And you could just tell there was a relaxation about her. And the second and third season, it was just a joy to be there. You know, she also had a huge amount on her plate the first season. I think she was recording and her fashion line had come out. Um, But we had a great time all three seasons. Um, but I think there was a special joy the second and third season when she you did this. The transformation. The transformation of a person saying, oh, I love this. And I know I'm good at it. Oh, so, I swear. Yes, I swear. Adding a talent. Well, also, it's, there were times when I would look at the producer, um, the writer-producer who would be sitting next to me while we would watch um, scenes, and I would say, did she just channel Lucy? <laughs> and we said, okay, here is this this African-American girl from Philadelphia channeling a white redhead uh, from 20 years ago. And I'm saying, <laughs> yeah, she just channeled Lucy. Uh, she is so funny. Oh, my God. Yeah, she 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 is. I, I've seen her on a couple things, and she seems really funny. And we have, like, uh, where's, three minutes. I want to get everything in about Mary Lou. Um, she's acted in musical theater and soaps in New York, which, my God, that could be a whole episode. Uh, I just, I want to hear you sing one day. We're going to have to ask you to beg I you to come back. I was 16 going on 17. Oh, that sounds so good. Now, see, you need to put an album out. Oh, no, you. Thank need you. to do your own musical theater CD. I sing in the bathtub. <laughs> and uh, so you were in theater and you came here and you've directed over 75 productions to her credit. I imagine any production I throw out, The Grapes of Wrath, you've done it. No, but no? actually, my <laughs> daughter just finished a production uh, at the uh, Performing Arts High School here in Los Angeles, oh, and it was marvelous. Fabulous. Yeah, I did that. She I played one of the youngest Jode uh, daughter. Ah, mm-hmm. oh, Ro- uh, Rosa Sharon. Uh, Rosa Sharon. Oh, the no, little, oh, little, the little, the little, little tiny. One. I never remember her name. She's tiny like me. Tiny little petite thing. Now, you say that you, you have many awards. The Prism Award, you have. What did you win your Emmy for, by the I way? won my Emmy for a uh, documentary that I did with uh, nine other women. What was it called? And it was called A Community of Caring. And each of us, ten of us, took a nonprofit organization and we did a short five to seven minute film about this nonprofit organization and how it contributes to the community and then it was woven together with a narrative of a mother teaching her daughter how to give back oh that's fantastic. and it was and it was really really and well where done. can we see that is there any you know i don't know you know it, it aired see? on uh, uh uh santa monica cable television um nancy malone was the exec producer um, and it was it was beautifully done. I mean, each little film was a, a gem in and of itself. My, <laughs> I have a great. My section was on a uh, group called Con, uh, Consumer Credit Counseling Service, which is a nonprofit organization. And on my shoot. Three people asked if they could sign up for the oh my god for consumer for, credit counseling for that. Oh great, you got the business now. You, uh, we have one minute. And I want to get this in. You have a citation from the late mayor Tom Bradley for your work with abused children. I know that you do want people to call and be mentors and to to. What is the number that they can call for that? Uh, you gave me a number for you for to read a literacy. Uh, oh, there's a there's a group I I, I um, read for called Reading. For the blind and dyslexic, R F B D, and um, it's a complete volunteer organization, and I read for them once a week. I just and, put in an hour, and that is what you should do too. If you want to get on Mary Lou's good side, no, you should do it because you're a good person. Do you know the number off the top of your head? I don't know their okay. number, but you can look it up. They have chapters website. in almost every major city. Okay, and lastly, you got something exciting coming up. You're going to Japan. What are you going to be doing? I've because just... my God, you do so much. She she uh, she lectures frequently throughout the United States and universities like FI, NYU, Northwestern, and you're going to be in Japan. Let's end with I, that. I will be judging the Sapporo Shorts Film Festival, um, and it's um, the third film festival I've judged, but I don't think I've quite I've gone quite as far before. I'll be in Sapporo, Japan in September. Fantastic. And she's on the advisory committee for 3MinuteHighSchool.com. So you want to know everything, Mary Lou? I guess we could go to... 
IMDb. Do you have your own website? Which I have my own. I have two you, websites. I have um, www.sitcomcareer.com and actingforyoungactors.com. Dot com. So you go there and you find out everything else about Mary Lou. Mary Lou, thank you so much for coming on the show. We appreciate it. God bless your little heart. You're such a good woman. And thank you for listening to the show. Have a great time and we'll see you next week on Question Reality.